ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think we've all seen what the exploits of AI can do in the, earlier in the morning with Pepper. So I'm delighted to present uh, a panel who has a lot of expertise from dis different perspectives on tech to discuss how best to spur tech companies in what is already a very dynamic uh, environment. Let me start by introducing the experts. On my left, I have uh, Stéphane Bougna, the CEO of Euronext. On my right, I have Dominique Gaillard, chairman of France Invest, and also chairman of Ardian France. Um, next to him is Philippe Freise, who is head of TMT for KKR EMEA. And Edouard Plus, uh, who is um, chief swave rider, but that translates into our less lingo uh, sort of youth jargon as uh, the managing director of Le Suave, which is a platform dedicated to accompanying fintech. Um, alongside him at the end, but last but not least, is Jean-Stéphane Arcis, CEO of Talentsoft, which uh, recently received a Future Unicorn Award from uh, the Euronext and is um, number one leader for the European software, uh, HR software in the cloud. And just in time, next to him, is uh, Frédéric Mazella, founder and president of Blah Blah Car, who had a very good night last night, I gather, um, at a party, I'm told, from my sources. <laughs> um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. And can I kick off, perhaps, with Dominique, with one of the questions that preoccupies everybody, which is money. There hasn't been too little in some sense. There's been too much money chasing too few deals. Would you like to expand on that and what the problems perhaps are? Sure, but maybe before, just to give you one or two figures uh, that uh, I think are meaningful in uh, following what uh, the governor of uh, Bank of the France uh, said earlier this morning. In France, uh, last year in 2017, 1.2 billion euro were invested in innovative company which is nearly 50% uh, more than last year. So in France, and uh, I think we can say the same for most of the European countries, including uh, UK, uh, the money flowing to, um, to the venture world is, is growing. It's not at the levels of what you can find in the US or in China, but it's clearly uh, uh, growing. And that's uh, probably thanks to the uh, uh, French tech ecosystem that has been put in place and has been proving to be extremely efficient for the last uh, uh, four years. Um, maybe Edouard will speak about it later, but uh, at Station F, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Villarot Gallo was mentioning this morning, there are more than 1,000 startups there, and uh, clearly there are numbers of incubators uh, elsewhere in Paris, but also in the main cities of France. So <coughs> creating and uh, nurturing uh, startups is really something that is working very well today. The problem is uh, more that uh, we have a difficulty yet to make them scale up. Uh, there was a recent study that was published two or three days ago mentioning that in France, <coughs> there was a capacity outside of the existing unicorn, and we have a representative here on, on this panel, uh, there is a capacity for France to generate not more than 10 uh, future unicorns, which is probably uh, three times less than in the UK and less than in Germany. So the, the problem that we have today is clearly to make them grow up, uh, maybe, maybe be more selective and make them uh, grow up. And uh, uh, to refer to your question, too few deals for too much money. Uh, a colleague of mine was telling me last week that uh, for the same company, uh, four years ago, there was uh, one term sheet or two term sheet for financing in equity. Uh, one for the same company today, the, the managers receive uh, six term sheets and at the valuation which are in, uh, in average four times higher than what they were uh, four years ago. So that's uh, a big uh, problematic for the whole system because uh, one day we'll have to exit from this company and if the entry price is high, then uh, we'll have to be sure that the exit price is high. Uh, Philip, perhaps I could turn to you. Um, from KKR's point of view, there is a lot of money sloshing around. I don't know what you think of valuations, but also there isn't as much money as the governor of the Bank of France pointed out, as much money as in the US or perhaps even in China. What do you think of these two twin problems? Yeah, good morning. First of all, as a Franco Allemand, I would like to pay tribute to uh, your national football team. 
It is very painful as a German to have been eliminated that early, but bravo, bravo la France. We see what happens tonight, but it would be almost ironic in a political context if the final would be France-England on Sunday. Um, uh, my heart will go very firmly to France. Uh, <laughs> we see. Anyway, um, now coming back to the point. Um, look, the key point here is France is back on the map. I think two years ago it would have almost impossible to uh, create so much excitement about investing in France, about finding unicorns in France, about pointing out that there's a lot of talent in France. You have wonderful universities, you have uh, higher productivity than almost any other region in the world. There was an, a, a cloud overhanging France of negativity and pessimism. That has gone now. I myself, when I was at KKR um, in 2003 to 2005, was very much involved in doing the same reforms that Macron is doing in your country now in Germany, and it almost feels the same. Of course, there was a lot of question marks at the time. These things do not happen overnight, but you see where Germany is now. I have absolutely no doubt that France can be there as well in you know, five to ten years. Now, that kind of optimism, in my mind, explains partly why more capital is coming in. As a whole of Europe, the problem we have compared to other regions in the world America, which is now led by a very muscular president who only pursues its own advantage. And of course, China, we heard um, just um, on the previous panel the perspective there. Uh, in a very impressive way, the way China supports startups, that leads to the fact that we, we are in Europe outsized 10 to 1 in terms of capital. So my concern as a European, and I come back to KKR in one second, wouldn't be that there is too much capital coming in in Europe. We only have 10% of what China and America still have. The good news is not only do we have a watershed moment with the reforms that uh, your president uh, and his administration are so ably doing in this country, but we also have a watershed moment with um, Daniel Act and Spotify, which shows the world that European startups can actually become not only unicorns, because quite frankly, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, one day unicorn, the other day you can be outcompeted by a Chinese company, which can have 10 times more capital. What really means something if you have global market share leadership, which is what Spotify has. Of course, Blablaka has a problem if Uber or Didi Jinping or other companies in the mobility space raise 10, 20 times the capital that it can raise. However, if a brand name investor like Index supports Blablaka, it's very good. I think what the key question in Europe is, it's not so much whether we have too much capital chasing too few opportunities, it's whether we have the skills to build more global companies. We see it with Zalando, we see it with Rocket, Blablaka, that this is actually possible. I personally would be very positive about the potential of France together with Berlin and, and other centers in Europe to actually over time uh, grow in importance. We have a 750 million technology fund called Next Generation Technology. That fund is almost 70-80% uh, invested. We have two-thirds of that fund invested in Europe. The reason for that is if you look at supply demand um, characteristics, it's just more interesting to find opportunities in Europe because they're, they're more premature. You can do more for these companies. You can help them go global. You can help them find the right partners. I mean, whatever um, the outcome with Spotify now is, we are all more intelligent now, but it was a real risk to invest there, and it might be the same for Blah Blah Car. Um, you actually can mitigate the risk of whether a company becomes a global leader by how much capital you invest. So to summarize, I would be very positive about um, the opportunity in Europe, and above all, I would be very positive about the opportunity in Paris uh, and in France. Frederick, can I um, jump to you, if I may? Uh, we've been mentioning blah, blah, car. What, what do you make uh, of that for perhaps people who are earlier in their gestation than you are, but also what would have helped you more at the early stages? Well, uh, there's been, uh, when, we, when we launched, the concept was uh, quite 
new. Uh, it was sharing cars. So what we do is carpooling. So we help people uh, drive together and share the cost on the way. Uh, at the time, it sounded like a bit crazy, and uh, you know the word sharing economy came in uh, very. Uh, very late, actually in 2011, 2012, we were earlier than that. And so at the beginning to get some money from the investors with such a concept uh, was difficult just because the context was not the right one to understand that uh, all the new technologies we had created would allow a massive better usage of our assets, whether it's homes or uh, cars or other things. And um, so it would have helped if the context had been hit before, but it wasn't the case. So we had to build the company, including with some other business models than the one we have today, in order to uh, actually sustain the company until the point we could raise capital fund and uh, really on the concept that we have today. Uh, so we did sold, um, we did sell a lot of uh, uh, softwares to companies as well. So we had a B2B model in the, in the, at the beginning to sustain our cost. And then we switched to the consumer business model because investors could support that theory when we had more than one or two million members. But reaching those one, two million members uh, at the beginning was super tough. Do you think capital would be easier to come by now? Yes, I think on this concept it would be easier so. because uh, we have all understood now that uh, actually there is in the physical world some assets which are totally underutilized and that new technologies with databases, uh, uh, connectivity and search engines can actually leverage. And so this is a concept that everybody has understood now. And uh, we, yeah, it, it would be easier to raise, but it would be too late as well because we're here. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'd like to put the question of scaling to Jean-Stéphane and also Stéphane from Euronex. Let me start with you, Jean-Stéphane, um, from a business-to-business -business perspective. How does France, Europe, go about, your clients are European, not just French. So how do you go about scaling better? Yeah, today uh, Talentsoft is a B2B champion in Europe. And um, I really think there is no... Um, as every chance really to make a global champion uh, in B2B for French tech or European tech. Um, there is, I think, um, as you said, enough interest from different private equity now and to fuel Series C or Series D of a large scale or larger sc or maybe the double of what it was maybe just three years ago. So excellent news. Um, as a B2B champion, Talentsoft, I would say that there is also a key role that the top 50 global companies in Europe or the top 200 or, or the CAC 40 in France, for example, can really play for scale-ups. So there is a key role here. And today it is still a um, vendor-customer relationship. This should really change. And um, every, in every CAC 40 company, we, we, you do have a chief innovation officer or a chief digital officer. And that could be their responsibility to develop global partnerships and long-term partnerships with French tech or European tech uh, in order to make sure that they become global scale-ups. Okay? This is not the case today. Maybe more the case in China or elsewhere. And just a second point, one of my dream as an, as an entrepreneur is to have this talent soft brand in software and B2B software be there in 20 years, a little bit like Dassault system or business object at some point, okay? And for that, I really need a strong Euronext or a strong uh, Europe, uh, NASDAQ in Europe, okay? So it's so obvious for me, if I still want to be independent in 10 years time, and still have most of the innovation coming from Europe, I need decent valuation in Euronext or in uh, European NASDAQ in, in the coming years. So I think this is a key next step for entrepreneurs that has this dream like me. Stefan, I think that's your cue. <laughs> okay. Well, we are here, available, open for business. Um, I, I think y your point is, is absolutely right. I believe that stock markets, and your next particular in Europe, is the, is the only uh, long-term uh, solution for late-stage funding. I mean, 
I mean, we can discuss uh, the, the, the new situation that emerged over the past five years about the increasing role of private equity in uh, providing funding, and you, you, you alluded on that point, but uh, fundamentally, ultimately, uh, stock markets are, are the place to get, uh, to provide liquidity to the ones who want to exit and to provide uh, funding for growth for the ones who want to stay. And, um, and, and that's what we are trying to build. I mean, today we have uh, 350 technology companies listed on, on your next markets. Uh, we have in Europe uh, now uh, 57 unicorns. Most of them are not listed yet, uh, but uh, we had only 47 uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we have big success stories at European level. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we had the IPO of ADN in, 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 uh, on Euronext Amsterdam with the 14 billion uh, uh, market cap. So, I mean, that, that's just amazing what Europe can produce. And, and you're right, the only, the only relevant scale is, is, is the European scale. What is interesting is that Euronext is very different from other stock markets in Europe because we have a clear mandate to power pan-European capital markets to finance the real economy and to finance technology. For all sorts of historical reasons, uh, other, other stock markets have, are less focused on that purpose because they operate in markets where equity financing is less relevant or they operate in, in, on businesses where, where post-trade uh, uh, businesses are much more attractive and profitable than, than financing uh, growth through, through markets. But clearly, uh, we want to build at the European level the right uh, liquidity pool because at the end of the day what you need is, is a critical mass of issuers, I think we have it now, a critical mass of investors, it's ongoing fighting, and we need to make sure that, uh, and that's a debate with Solvency 2 and others, that uh, institutional investors are, are refocusing more on, on, on the tech segment. And we need also to address the, the third pillar, which is uh, uh, finding a new business model for equity research analysts, because that's probably uh, the, 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 the black uh, angle or black hole of, of the system. But clearly, I mean, that European, a proper European liquidity pool for technology companies is available, is there, and, uh, and we need to grow it. Let me conclude with an analogy with the, with the blue chips world. You know, the largest listed company on Euronext is AB InBev. They are headquartered in Leuven. Uh, they started with Stella Artois, they, involve, uh, they, they bought uh, uh, Modelo, etc. Their market cap is around 190 billion. They are listed in Brussels. If Brussels was an independent market, financial market, they would never find enough liquidity to accommodate the needs of a company of that size. The only reason why uh, a real impressive blue chip company like Ebin Bevin listed on Euronex is because they are part of a European liquidity pool, a single order book, and a European technology platform. And that's what we offer to, to European companies. So we can di di discuss at length the debate between uh, uh, NASDAQ um, uh, alternatives, but the reality is that if you want to go local, then you can IPO on the local markets, and m in most cases they are tiny. Even in large countries, some, 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 lo some, some local markets are very tiny. If you want to go global and you can afford it, and you have a US strategy, and your board is, uh, as, uh, is committed to, to, uh, to go to, to, towards all the, 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 the difficulties and the drawbacks of being listed, and as that you can try it, but you have to be visible. To, uh, because if you are small, you become minuscule uh, and in the NASDAQ uh, benchmark. Or if you want to go Europe, you go, you go Euronext. So that's what we are trying to offer to, to our clients. And I want to insist on that. Our focus is to build uh, an ecosystem which transitions from being private to being public by doing only one single thing, preparing teams and individuals to the world of public equity. That's why we have a program called TechShare, which now is going to accommodate 120 companies all from all over the, the continent to prepare them to becoming listed. In other words, we build a qualified deal flow for everyone because ultimately the only way to, to avoid the thermal shock from private to public is to be exposed to what it means. And doing that over time in the form of a TAPAS MBA that we do uh, with this TechShare program is by far the most uh, uh, impactful way to, to prepare the ecosystem to be exposed to public equity markets. Um, I, I was going to ask something about the Macron programs, but I just want to come back to that, Edouard, in one second. I want to ask on the liquidity pool, both to Dominique and to Philippe, what do you think about the European liquidity pool? Is it not to some extent fractured still? And I'd ask either of you, both of you, what do you think about Paris? Uh, how does it measure up 
compared with other European capital as a startup center? First on Paris or? Yeah. I mean, I said it already. I think that um, together, Europe is the largest economic area of the world. The problem we have had is a Europe of different speeds in the past, right? You had Germany, which was the sick man of Europe in 2000 and did some very tough reforms from 2003 to 2005 and now is um, taking advantage of it and is, is far ahead of some other countries in Europe. I think it's a unique moment and I think we have more than 1,000 LPs in KKR and every single one we are telling, it's a unique moment for Europe that you now have France with a dynamic young president who is enacting reforms, who has done more in the first year in his office than Schröder did in his full term, um, to see that basically France and Germany, which are almost half of Europe, um, going in the same direction of dynamism, supply side reforms. I saw some of the comments earlier that people say, the, the bottleneck is not so much how much capital wants to come to Europe, the bottleneck is how much interesting companies and skills you find. So education, an attractive environment for people to actually invest. Um, how do you look at risk taking in terms of starting several companies um, when you have failed one? How do we you know, join forces to promote economic reform beyond one country in, in a European context? I think we see a lot of positiveness here. Uh, from Paris. So what does it mean for Paris? I think Paris right now, if you compare it to Berlin and certainly to London, is at the top of where large institutional investors like KKR are looking to make investments. Maybe one word, uh, let me take uh, for five minutes my uh, hat of uh, head of uh, France Invest, you know, the, the association uh, covering all the uh, private equity players in France. Uh, we are very much welcoming the uh, Anglo-Saxon funds that are coming to to be the, the providers of Series D and Series C financing on the, on the big companies that we have in France. Uh, that being said, we would like to promote the, uh, the development of a new uh, or additional French players who are able to, uh, to put uh, between 50 and 100 million euros on one company, uh, which is clearly not the case yet today. Maybe our two, three players are able to do that. And uh, <coughs> I would really like to to uh, extend this capacity from French players, raising gross funds of uh, may maybe uh, beyond one billion so that they can take alongside uh, KKR and the other US uh, players can uh, participate to the last range of uh, financing of these uh, unicorns before they go on uh, your next. I see. Well, Edward, let me ask you to come in perhaps on the point uh, Philippe was making. Do you feel there has been a change in the culture of risk taking and the like? And how much difference do you think the first year of Monsieur Macron, President Macron's uh, reforms have made? Well, um, first, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, say a few words. Um, a lot has been said already. Uh, part of it was talking about Babacar, and you're going to see there's some kind of a bridge. Uh, you said that back then, the project was a bit of crazy. It sounded crazy. I think that last year or two years ago, you would have said that Macron would become president. Everybody would have said, yeah, that's crazy too. And in the end, it happened. And that's the thing with Paris right now. The, the, the goal of Paris is actually to, to make crazy the new normal. To, make, to, to spur new tech companies, you need to, to, cro to cross a few bridges, cross a few lines, and make what was crazy before likely or possible now. So. The election of Macron literally didn't do much but sent a strong signal. I mean, it's, it's been too short. A year is just too short to, to, to have new reforms that are really structurally making a difference. But yet it set, it sent a very strong signal to the uh, innovation world. Uh, literally, well, the project I'm running was created in the wake of uh, his election because all of a sudden creating an innovation platform dedica dedicated to fintech companies was something that was making sense. We had expertise on the French territory, we had top players, we have some around this table, and we had nothing to foster innovation in that field. And that's really we, something we needed to do. So, so far it was more of a signal. We're hoping for reforms, obviously, but what was interested is like since last year, I keep receiving uh, messages and applications for uh, foreign companies, or even worse, companies that were set up abroad by French people trying to come back on the territory say, saying, yeah, Actually, as you said, Paris is back on the map. 
And this is what we're working for, what we should okay. keep doing. But if I may just say a few words, because Stefan mentioned something between uh, coming from pri private to public listing. There's one step before that for startup companies, tech companies that are created on the French territory or in Europe itself. It's create a cross-border market. I mean, legally, it's implemented. But yet, for young companies to go abroad, to go to Germany, for example, I have a few examples in, uh, in my innovation platform, to go uh, to the Netherlands, to go to Spain, to go to Italy, there's still some cultural challenges that need to be faced. And that's the moment where we need to help them. That's the moment where uh, Europe is, is waited for. We need to create an identity and a, a business identity if we want to compete with China, with the uh, US. That's really our challenge today. I think that's also where good funds can make a difference. I remember when KKR invested in Fotoya, it basically had two markets, it was Paris and Berlin. Uh, in two years, we opened in 10 European countries and 15 countries in, in Asia, and it's now what Adobe's Microstock's uh, division is. I think we all should be very proud of that. It's a European company at heart, which is now powering a global uh, power uh, you know, company in Silicon Valley. But this is only doa doable if we find good founders, and quite frankly, we as investors, we have a job which goes beyond investing. That's exactly what we need to do, to help you open in all these countries and combine maybe you with some other companies we have in our portfolio to create commercial linkages, yeah? Maybe one word on that. Uh, what makes me very optimistic is that uh, compared to 10 years ago, the, uh, the managers that we are backing today, first they think global immediately. Uh, I know it's complicated to cross the borders, but in the business plan, in the way they, they want to develop, in the way they get finance, they speak, they think uh, international and European right from the beginning. That's uh, a main difference compared to what was uh, happening on the French market 10 years ago. Yeah. Also, one, one other point I want to underline. We are a European company and I love all the Euronext countries the same and so on. But uh, there is something which is very particular to this very country, which France, which makes a big difference in the new wave of, uh, of technology venture which is the, the critical size uh, and the depth of the hard tech talent pool. Uh, they are, because we, we paint in, in tech uh, a combination of uh, uh, commerce business models enabled by emerging technologies, uh, and we combine that with real hard tech innovations. Uh, the, the, the challenge uh, to, to bridge the gap with the US, in my view, is not to find money, which is a commodity. Uh, the challenge is to bridge the gap with the depth, the density of hard technology talents uh, that are around the table in the, in the technology companies in the US versus Europe. In this respect, for all sorts of historical reasons that are too long to explain here, or no matter how much I love history, um, the, 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 the density of, of hardcore uh, engineers, uh, innovative techie guys you find in French companies makes them different in general, by and large. Obviously, there are all sorts of exceptions and great, great, great engineering schools everywhere in Europe, but the capability to attract them in, in technology, innovative products is, is, is becoming unique or is becoming a differentiator of the French technology ecosystem. And maybe I could add uh, one positive note on talents, uh, and this is really a, a short story here just discovered that in the Talentsoft R&D, so it's 200 people, uh, there is now uh, interns coming from Polytechnic that come and they really want to spend a few quarters just developing software, okay? And this is just, if you can look at the, uh, the change of culture that uh, uh, this is, because I suppose uh, five years ago, they all wanted to have internship in a very large organizations and not in a, a French tech organization. Okay, so this is really a positive note for me. On another note, I would say on talents, there are some jobs that are not too technical, but for uh, typically for B2B or enterprise software, such as product owners, for example. And we really have a lack uh, of uh, education linked to or even any type of uh, education track on these type of jobs, okay? So we are still missing and we need sometimes to attract talents coming from other uh, countries in order to fill the gaps. 
So uh, maybe some targeted uh, efforts on that will, will uh, really uh, have a big impact in the coming years. I would uh, emphasize on talent as well, uh, because we always see the um, necessity of growing for companies linked to how uh, good they are at attracting uh, capital. But actually, capital is a lot more mobile than talent. Uh, because talent, when you, uh, when you have someone who's moved in a region of the world with his family, his kids go to school and everything, and you ask them to go to another region of the world to work for another company, it's actually super hard. Um, so it's either pushed by financial needs or uh, by the um, willingness to see their family back if they want to come back to their home country. Uh, but it's... Um, it's super hard to, uh, to, to go beyond that. And in the past years, uh, what I've witnessed, especially in the last year, is, um, and, and I'll be speaking more for the, uh, the French people who could uh, have uh, gone like anywhere on the planet to work for any kind of uh, big international company, we see that um, the attractivity of France and of French companies is changing, and so some people who had been abroad for 10 or 12 years working for international companies, whether it's in Silicon Valley or in Asia or anywhere, um, are thinking and are coming back to uh, French companies to help them grow, which is what we need now because we need international talent for our good companies uh, who need to scale internationally and we need people who've done that before. And uh, specifically on the product management uh, thing, which is a very important talent to have in your company, um, what I've seen is that in many uh, US companies, half of the product management team are actually um, ex-entrepreneurs uh, because uh, the, the people who are the best suited for designing a product, uh, making a product is uh, solving problems. So you have people who want the marketing team, people who do the tech team, and you have the product team in the middle who is just like struggling to, uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to actually build uh, what the marketing people want uh, with what the tech people can do. And so you have to solve uh, problems and actually, uh, yeah, half of the uh, good product managers are usually ex-entrepreneurs who have had this experience of actually having an idea, uh, solving it and making it happen. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to jump in. Uh after the, the two, two previous interventions, actually, there's also a question for me that is very cultural, as I said earlier, which is how we price success in, uh, in France as a thing. Because we, we keep comparing the US with France. But I remember a former humorist French that when studied abroad and said, well, if you, if you go study in the US, when you graduate, you're all dressed up, you sort of throw your hat in the, in the air, you have a party, everybody's happy. When you graduate from the French university, you mostly receive your degree in an old envelope with your own handwriting on it. And that's it. And you can go straight looking for a job. While on the US campus, you get companies looking for, uh, for uh, new talents. Obviously, the way we praise success is the same with startups. I mean, sometimes we, we're not really good at saying what we do is good. And I do understand that for an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur that is starting a, a, a business project that is tough. I mean, you've got ups and downs, mostly downs even though capital is coming in. And at some point, if you don't have an environment that is positive, that tells you, okay, what you're doing is actually good. You're gonna make it. We're proud of what you're doing. Well, then you've got no reason to come back. Ma Macron's election last time, as said, was, was a, a positive signal. But we, we need to, to leverage on that, just to keep that positive thinking, just to, to say to the entrepreneurs of the world, you can do it here. You can do it here, you can come back. It's not just a question of, yeah, okay, I've been learning in the, in, in the US and by some kind of patriotic way I'm coming back or because my family is in France. It's also because, you know, you can do it here. You've got capital, you've got all the infrastructures, you've got all the academic training you want, and the quality is good. Even though I agree with you, uh, Stefan, you've got uh, on education, uh, the, the way we teach is probably not project or, uh, oriented enough, which is something that is a bit different also when you want to create a company. In France, we're good at learning stuff and repeating them, which is not really that good, you know, if you want to create a company. But if we become aware that actually we have some, some work to do on that field, if we can leverage on that, on that way that has been created, then, well, we'll come through. That's the idea. I want to support this. So I had the great pleasure in 1995 to do the Troisième Année in, in EDEC Lille. And after that, I went to business school in the US. And this is very important, actually. It is a good example of why we Europeans, and above all, um, you French, uh, we French, 
we should be more positive about what we have. Our education is unparalleled. Um, it's just that other regions of the world are better in marketing. Now, why do I say that? You have a brilliant president in marketing. He understands soft power. It's almost Reagan-esque what he's doing. So what I'm personally, I mean, um, I know this is not off the record, but I would still venture to say, you know, I've said to Madame Merkel, support him, because this is a moment where we have four years in Europe right now to create positiveness and to show the, to the world that there is a positive example out of Europe between Germany and France at a very dark moment in history where the beacon of the free world is embracing uh, trade barriers and um, quite frankly we can mount another model. It's very encouraging to see China work hand in hand with Europe here. Um, and I have to also pay tribute to China. We are a very active investor in China. If you see what they do for their tech ecosystem and for the dynamism of entrepreneurship, you can almost you could almost say that the Communist Party of China is a giant venture capital firm. <laughs> Bravo. Th they'd love it. And but this is what Macron understands. As a president of France, and quite frankly, as the Chancellor of Germany, you are also in charge of a giant soft power opportunity. Uh, to convince the David Marcus of the world, I mean, a brilliant entrepreneur who once said to me he would never come back from Silicon Valley to Paris. Now he's thinking about it, because why would I stay in a country where human rights are kicked with feet, right? So this is our moment. Let's work together. We have four years to prove it. And it's always easy. We are more critical of each other in Europe uh, to say, to find the negatives. Yesterday I was in the car from Charles de Gaulle to the hotel, and I say to the cab driver, you know, France, you're leading 1-0, fantastic. Statistics show GDP on average grows 0.5% faster when a country wins the, the World Cup. <laughs> and he was like, oh, monsieur, ça rien à voir, quand même, après un an, je suis pas sûr, on se sent pas vraiment mieux. You know, this is, of course, people are doubting, but this is our moment. So I just want to say, as European, uh, and yes, you're right, of course, I represent uh, KKR, but if you look at who's behind KKR, uh, there are some very big European investors as well in it. I think we all should see that as a unique moment. We should fight for the next four years. I think KKR is very positive of Paris, of Berlin. Um, it's also a very big business opportunity because we have been overlooked so long here that valuations, quite frankly, we might uh, feel that valuations in Europe are getting a bit higher. But you compare that to anything in Silicon Valley, and quite frankly, you compare that to anything in Beijing right now. Um, and as, you know, look at what SoftBank Vision Fund is doing, right? Um, some of the investments in Europe, you know, are actually quite interesting. I'm waiting for BlaBlaCar to announce that they are the next one. But so I'm saying, in summary, let's be positive. Let's fight together. It's our moment. And I'm, I'm refusing to be negative about it. And quite frankly, that's also what KKR will do in terms of investing policy in the next few years, yeah. Looking at all the smiles on the faces of the audience, I think that you have a, an auditoire who is, who is very positive in line with what you say. Yeah? Uh, since the debate moved to some soft issues and cultural issues, I want to bring a little nuance at the risk of, of being uh, gloomy and uh, casser l'ambiance, but uh, which we know, which is the following. All what we are doing together for the past five, 10 years, 20 years, is based on the assumption that uh, integration of markets, openness, uh, uh, mark basic uh, uh, free market assumptions prevail, and that they will uh, continue to be deepened to offer the most efficient market to, to what we do. Now, we have to, and, and if we continue drinking mojitos on rooftops and celebrating our success and IPOs, etc., without noticing that uh, there is a growing number of people in the societies where we operate that uh, eat uh, ice cream in front of uh, flat screens and, and really feeling uh, uh, challenged in their life by what globalization brings to them and that eventually all that translates into, uh, into major changes in, um, in, in societies which can, depending on the voting systems of the representing countries or the weakness of the elected leader, outgoing, etc., uh, translates in more or less uh, a dramatic uh, outcome. If we don't, if we if we don't look at that, if we remain blind and isolated among ourselves, then we we run the risk of of of, of hangover and, and very 
very, very depressing wake-up calls. Now, <clears throat> I believe that the tech sector has a unique role to play, the tech investors, the tech, because they are the most natural bridge between the social contract runs finance and the, and the market economy and openness. Because in all our respective countries, small is beautiful. Mobility is beautiful. What is bad is, you know, as, as I used to say many years ago, uh, venture capital is good, pension fund is bad. Uh, a startup uh, uh, successful leaders is good, uh, global leader of uh, an incumbent blue chip is bad. So um, <clears throat> it, the more uh, tech leaders, the more technology companies, the more uh, VCs, the more private equity guys will be aware that one part of the mandate of those companies is to defend, preserve, protect the culture of openness and integrated markets, which is a fundamental underlying assumption of the success, the more uh, what we want to achieve will, will, will prevail, and by the way, the more we will behave as not autistic uh, leaders. Uh, the less we will do that, the more we will be focused, the more we run the risk of being precisely wrong rather than roughly correct. And, um, and that, that, that's a, a bit gloomy, but that's the reality, because if we read papers and watch TV, we cannot stay completely um, uh, um, autist vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those new realities. And, 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 and it's, not, it's not over, it's not dead, we can, we can reverse this trend, but it requires time, uh, listening, and commitment. I think it's a brilliant point. It might help that I'm here today as a German who helped retool Germany. Germany was the sick man of Europe. I will never forget in 2003, I saw the IG Metall, which is our metal union, m move up in a massive demonstration up a giant hill in, in Bochum, which is in the industrial heartland, to demonstrate against some of the measures that we had to help enact to make uh, one of our companies more flexible, more successful. If you look at the same company, it's now listed um, uh, at your uh, sister company uh, in, in Frankfurt. It's a successful global leader for, for industrial cranes worldwide. And it's taking advantage of global supply chains. It's investing more into R&D and innovation today than it was investing in total in its business at the time. So these were very difficult reforms. I think the German social model was successful to guarantee employment for a certain while, while um, these employees were t making some important sacrifices in exchange for that job security, and in exchange the companies reinvesting into the, into the you know into these firms. Of course, you need to address fears of people. That's precisely why we see a wave of populism. The good news is here in Europe, and I'm very proud of you in Paris. Above all, you are showing the world that there's a different model. Macron won with a positive message and with a positive agenda. Uh, you don't have a president who's embracing trade protectionism. Fantastic. Now, of course, it's a promise only, and now he needs to make it successful. I'm just saying I'm positive because I saw Schröder and Merkel make it successful. It took 10 years. So I'm absolutely, and that's what I said to uh, the cab driver last night, it won't, you won't see it. The problem is our political cycles are not 10-year cycles. Um, so there's a whole debate about how we make sure we can help each other, because clearly Schröder in 03 was helped by France and other countries, because these reforms were enacted at a time where Europe was booming, uh, after the dot-com boom, etc., cetera, um, and there was positive exporting of Germany into Europe. So now the question is, how can we help France to be successful? But just the bottom line is, you, it's a very important point. This is a, a hope, a promise, an opportunity, we're encouraging all of our investing friends to invest in France right now, but you have to do it with open eyes that we are members of the community. We are responsible stewards of capital. When we help these companies become more flexible, more dynamic, you have to do it in a socially responsible way. Absolutely, yeah. Um, maybe just, obviously we're in the gloomy corner over here, Stefan. Let me add another dollop of gloom to the whole discussion. Um, I loved your comment about crazy being the new sort of normal. Unfortunately for the central banking community, normal is the new normal. So we are getting into the end, as Monsieur Le Gouverneur said this morning from the Bank of France, where we are getting to the end of unusual monetary policy, extreme accommodative monetary policy. Interest rates will be going up. You have trade wars starting with 
sort of more and more seriousness and the tariffs are getting higher. You have politics, as Stefan has said, in Italy, not just across the Atlantic, but closer to home, changing a little bit the dynamics of what one can expect out of the European Union. How hard is it for young tech startups, younger than yours, perhaps, Frédéric, to find in uh, what may be a slowing economic cycle, a rising interest rate uh, mood, the money they need, the the vim of the economic vim that they need to get going. I don't know if anybody would like to throw throw in their thoughts. I could take that one. <laughs> uh, so far, so good, to be honest, because the, the 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 gloom side of the, the business is not yet on the market. I mean, we see it coming. Uh, economists are are seeing it coming. We, we're talking about it. But so far, interest rates are still pretty low, actually. Raising capital is still rather easy, even though the mood is a bit changing. Uh, if I see the companies I'm uh, working for so far, didn't have any uh, problems raising capital. It's still surfing on the wave I was talking of before. I mean, it's been pretty quick. Obviously, we know that uh, it's going to get tougher. I mean, the, the, the breach was open at some point, and well, now it's going to uh, probably close or at least tighten a bit. But it, now it's time to get together. That's really the point of what we, we said with, uh, with uh, Philip, literally, that we have an opportunity. We have a, we, we, if we understand that actually Europe is just one, it's not just a, a coalition, it's just a, an identity, I think we'll make it through. I'm, I'm, I'm not super worried about that yet. Maybe later, but yet we're good. Very good. Could I... Uh uh, forget about uh, tech companies for a moment and go back to the more classical economy. Uh, two remarks on that. First is that uh, um, I've been in this, uh, in this world for 30 years now, and that's the first time ever uh, that for the last three months at the investment committees at Ardian, we now look at the impact on the business plan of the companies what we might invest in, the impact of, uh, of trade wars and uh, how these companies could be damaged by the coming trade wars. And that's something that I've never ever mentioned as any point of issue when we are deciding to invest in a company or not. And second, to come back on the social responsibility, also on, on the classical economy, not necessarily on the startup which have the different mechanism. Uh, at uh, France Invest, we want now to promote a uh, tax efficient system that will allow, allow the investors that want to share part of the uh, value creation created to all the employees, not only the managers, the managers have their management package and that's fine, but to all the employees uh, in a system which is uh, efficient and we hope to have that through the Edouard Pact uh, at that fall that will uh, uh, help us to be more accepted as a core social uh, within the economy and to, to convince the employees of companies we are, who are very often reluctant to have us on board that we are okay to share the value creation because we recognize the fact that we are not the only one or the managers are not the only one to create the value but also all the employees. I think that's really in line with what you were both saying. I don't know if... Um yeah, I would say in terms of the, the trend, I'm very positive uh, because, uh, again, in B2B, there is this big change in the workplace. Uh, a lot of people at work want to work in a uh, more agile, more transparent environment. And so we supply a solution and platform for that. So, so and even if we stay in Europe, we can create um, uh, a 300 million euro and more uh, recurrent revenue company just being the champion in Europe. So B2B, uh, yes, if we create this European champion, uh, we can really derive a lot of benefits from uh, this market, the trend and the size. Um, so yes, very positive uh, for, for the trend. I don't see any impact yet in terms of uh, uh, economic trends or uh, uh, interest rates and, and so on. So a, a lot of interest and I think the, the key point for, for Talentsoft or for, for me is to make sure that um, uh, we can create uh, this global champion and as you said, making sure that we can have first a Series D, for example, with a large scale and then become independent at some point. So this is uh, uh, totally achievable. If I may just intervene, that's a, actually a very French question. Just say, okay, there, there's a, we're seeing in, in the distance uh, an economic downturn or slowdown or whatever. 
And we're so scared of being short-sighted that in the end we're just always uh, breaking, breaking down and just saying, okay, let, let's slow down ourselves because I don't want to be the one to invest last, literally. That's, a, that's a, the, the belief in, uh, in, in the future. At least it's coming with a good Anglo-Saxon accent. It is. <laughs> I give you one statistic which can give you confidence. 70% of the outperformance of the U.S. capital markets over Europe in the last 10 years is simply because the U.S. is over-indexed in tech. In other words, we just don't have enough of it in Europe, which means all of us who invest in tech, um, there will be an opportunity in the next 10 years to, because, you know, healthcare, education, supply chain, you know, everything we talked about, all of these sectors will be fundamentally transformed by technology, and we in Europe will catch up as much as other continents are catching up. So there's, of course, um, reason to be optimistic. Uh, clearly, you have to look at valuations. I remember uh, <coughs> discussing once with Klaus Hommels, who is an early investor in Spotify, the, dis the, the valuation of WhatsApp, when everybody in Europe said, it's absolutely crazy what Facebook did. And he put a chart on which showed the total value of the SMS market and how that would be going down to zero and what that means for the valuation. But we just completely missed it. So I think the big picture here, coming back to your point on tech, is fundamentally positive in Europe. It's interesting for investors because other than SAP, uh, we just don't have as much here. So that's a positive. On the rest of the economy, let's not underestimate the importance of soft power. And we just see a very good example of how not to do it in Germany when the market and the country is at the absolute top of its performance, how to scupper that opportunity, quite frankly. And France is at the other side of the equation with optimism, positiveness. Again, that's the reason why Paris is at the top of where people want to invest in Europe right now. I can only encourage all of you, all of us, to continue on that path, yeah. Can I ask then, I think we're pretty much out of time, so I'm just going to wind up and I'm going to ask you to um, aim for the sky. You sound like you're very happy with the reforms and the government you've got and everything that's going on in the economy and the football performance. So can I ask you, however, going around in order of seating, if you could change one thing or you could get Monsieur Macron to change one thing for you to remove an obstacle, just that one thing, what could it be? And would you just limit it to five words, please? I'll unfortunately start with you, Frederick, who hasn't had the chance to prepare. Um, I, I would go for uh, making everything we can to make uh, the uh, digital single market uh, a reality in Europe, meaning uh, anything that is different should be made uh, equal, um, namely VAT, labor laws, uh, anything that prevents uh, a, a company which was born in one country to grow fast in the other countries, because sometimes um, what I compare to is like growing a company in the US or in China is like running a 100 meters uh, run race. And uh, creating the same company from Europe is uh, running a 110 meters hurdle race because we're recreating a new company each time. And so anything that can make it easier to duplicate a business from one country to the next will be good for our fast growing companies. So as I said at the beginning, uh, making sure that K40 companies are sponsoring the French tech and making maybe the, the CDOs or the chief innovation officer responsible for that because CIOs, they, they have already uh, their habits and uh, it will be difficult for them to change. So that's uh, my request. Uh, mine would be about eligibility of public mechanism to settle down in France for uh, foreign companies because we have a lot of wonderful mechanism to start up in Paris or in France in general. We have a, a problem of publicity and lisibility of, uh, of all those mechanisms to make it simple. I would say um, continue doing what he's doing. Brexit is a, is a tragedy for Europe, but take advantage of it in a very proactive and considered way to make Paris the center of the investing community in Europe. He has an opportunity to do it. There's more to do on it, but keep that course. Yeah, I think that if he continues to, uh, to push for having a unified Europe, that will be a, a tremendous impact on our companies. And uh, I know it's a very difficult uh, exercise right now, but I think that should be his priority for the next two years. Huh? Invest massively in hardcore real technology which means investing people. Uh, today, the world invests more or less 30 billion 
of U.S. dollars in uh, artificial intelligence research. 15 billion are spent or invested in the U.S., about 10 billion in China, and five across Europe. So unless we allocate uh, collective resources to people, developments, uh, to talents, to, to hardcore research, the fundamental pillars of, of power will ultimately switch in less than a generation. And, um, and that, that's, that's for me the, the, the key uh, element to make sustainable our way of life. Thank you.